morning, Christian. Hello, good morning. Okay, yeah, I'm recording. Yeah, stop that. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so good morning, and thank you all for joining this morning. I'm going to talk about routine bias, technical change, structure of employment, and cross-country income differences. And this is a uh, joint work with uh, Vanna Pena, who's also in the audience, and and uh, one of our PhD students. Um, so, the motivation for this project is that there is, of course, a large literature in macroeconomics trying to account for cross-country differences in GDP per capita or in GDP per worker. And in general, this literature finds that there is a very large role for technology in explaining these differences in living standards or labor productivity, which ultimately income per worker is across countries. And this is true in terms of accounting for neutral technologies such as TFP, so where you don't take a stance on technology augmenting one factor more than the other, but you have this general notion of TFP that makes all production factors more uh, productive. And it's also true in more recent literature that uh, differentiates between skilled and unskilled labor and allows for skill bias technologies. Um, so in general, the, this macro literature has established that technology matters a lot for cross-country income differences. But what this literature has not done is to think about the role of uh, workers' tasks um, or occupations. Um, and this is potentially important because the recent labor literature uh, emphasized that over the last 30 years, at least, um, there's been a lot of task bias technical change. So changes in technology that change the productivity of workers in certain tasks, uh, but not in all tasks. And what we do in this paper is we, we try to assess whether differences um, in technologies at the occupation level matter for GDP differences across countries. So while the motivation is perhaps the task by is technical change, we will focus on occupations because um, uh, we, we have data on occupations and we think that workers in different occupations perform different bundles of tasks. So when I will be talking about a routine bias technical change, I mean uh, change in the technology that's used by workers in occupations that are predominantly routine. Um, but before delving into the details, uh, I want to stand back, um, I want to take a step back and, and just talk more broadly about what could be a source of labor productivity differences. It could be technology, as I already mentioned, neutral technology or factor biased or factor augmenting technologies. But of course, it can also be differences in production factors. Um, so there could be different amounts of capital used by different countries and that um, maps to differences in, in incomes per capita. And equally, there can be differences in, in the labor use itself because there can be different types of labels. Um, so some literature has differentiated skilled and unskilled labor. And what we're doing here is we differentiate labor by occupations. So what we, we do here is we treat occupations in the production functions as distinct production factors. We are not treating them as perfect substitutes. And again, the rationale for this is that we think that workers in different occupations perform very different tasks. Uh, and therefore, it's unlikely that they should enter as a perfect substitute in the production function. This also means that workers potentially use different technologies because uh, every task has its own technology. And this implies that differences in the occupational composition by itself could also matter for um, productivity differences. Um, when you think about differences, in the type of labor used by different countries, uh, you can also right away think about differences in labor quality. Um, and um, we don't do this in our baseline because uh, that's a very strong requirement of the data, but in an extension, we, we also account for uh, human capital by um, fitting some efficiency units of labor from a mean wage regression. 
uh, but this doesn't change the results by that much for that subset of countries where we can do this. Instead, what I really want to focus on today is on the role of um, occupations and occupation-specific technologies. And what we, what we do in this paper is uh, we study occupation-specific technologies and their role for productivity in a framework that's similar to what I've been using with uh, Jofia Barani. So we will specify a production function here at the aggregate level uh, that will has inputs um, different occupational labor types as well as capital. And we will allow for each of these production factors, and that includes each of these occupations, to have a specific technology in each country. And then we will take this model to the data. It's a model just of the supply side of the economy. And we will take the, the first order conditions that firms have to the data, uh, which will allow us to infer these uh, factor-specific technologies country by country from the data once we parameterize the elasticity of substitution. Once we have those technologies, we can run some counterfactuals that shed some light on what is the role of technology differences um, across countries in explaining um, differences in GDP per hour worked, so in labor productivity. So this project here um, is a big effort in collecting data to do this. For the macro data needed, it's easy, right? We need some measure of GDP per hour worked. We do this in purchasing power parities, and we can get this right away from standard data sets, such as the Penworld tables. Um, you can equally get the capital stock from there. And we need data on the, the labor share in, in value added or in GDP, um, that, which we take where possible from the pen world tables, uh, but we augment this with uh, further data from the world development indicators and from, from ILO stat, from the International Labor Organization. Where it becomes tricky is to get data on labor by occupation. And in fact, as you will see later, um, the technologies we can infer from the data based on information on occupational income shares um, and occupational wages. So we need detailed information on occupations. We need employment and wages by occupation. And this is nothing that exists readily in standard macro data sets. So you need to go to somewhere else. And to some degree, you get some information again from the ILOSTAT database, but um, the information is quite limited and just for a few countries. Instead, what we do is we combine many different micro data sources. Um, so this includes a data set called occupational wages around the world. It includes um, it, it, proper micro data is from IPAMS International uh, for the USA, there's uh, IPAMS USA. And equally we use for, for the EU countries, the European Labor Force Survey and the European Statistics on Income and Living Conditions for Latin American and Caribbean countries is um, also some, some micro data similar to IPAMS uh, that we use. So that's the Harmonized Microdata Center for Household Service in Latin America and the Caribbean. And finally, we, we um, got some extract from a data set by the World Bank called um, the International Income Distribution Data Set. And for our analysis, we need to have information on these occupational indicators as well as on the macro indicators for each of the countries in the same year. And uh, we, we managed to construct a data set for 91 countries. Um, but we don't have information on all variables in the same years um, for, for all the countries. Instead, what we do to circumvent this problem to some degrees to focus on some cross sections. We construct a 2010 cross section where we take the most recent year available data, um, uh, which is often 2018, I think. For most countries, it's 2018. But if you don't have 2018, we take the earlier years, so 2017, and so on, to include as many countries as possible 
And this gives us 80 countries in total uh, in the 2010 cross section, um, out of which 61 have um, data on the labor share and GDP, which we will need for some of the accounting um, specifications. In an extension, which I won't have time to, to talk about today, we also conduct the analysis at the sectoral level, then it's uh, even fewer countries, of course, um, because we need to get even further information, which we get from the World Input Output Database, World Glimpse, and the GGDC Productivity Level Database. But for that subset of countries where we can do a sectoral analysis, um, the patterns that I will show you here today at the aggregate level also hold within broad sectors. So they also hold within services and within manufacturing. So most of what I will show you today does not seem to be driven by a sectoral composition. Okay, so in terms of occupations, um, as I said already, we're going to split um, the labor input by occupation based on the notion of the task content where we assign each occupation into one occupational group based on the predominant task content of, of that occupation. And then we try to replicate the outer and dawn assignment, which is to first assign occupations into either routine or non-routine based on their task content, um, and then to break up the non-routine group further into a, a manual group, which is the one that um, is non-routine and non-cognitive, and um, the non-routine cognitive occupations we will refer to as abstract. Um, the different data sets that we have, they have different occupational classification schemes, but this is broadly based on this ISCO 88 or ISCO 08 classification, and you have it here on the screen. So the fixed idea is our abstract occupation includes managers and professionals um, and technicians, whereas routine workers are, are those involved in uh, rather repetitive tasks in the production process or also office workers in rather repetitive um, um, jobs, such as clerical support workers. Um, whereas manual occupations, uh, they're the ones in, in, in elementary occupations. So we will have these three occupational groups. And the first thing I want to do with this data is to give you some descriptive analysis of the relationship between these occupational uh, labor outcomes and economic development, where economic development here is measured by the real GDP uh, in PPPs per hour worked. And I want to do this by showing you in the cross section of countries, the occupational employment shares, the occupational income shares. Uh, so that's a fraction of uh, labor income that goes to one certain occupation. And I want to show you uh, relative occupational wages. And I will do this in scatter plots against uh, GDP per hour worked um, in the cross section. So here's the first plot. This shows you um, how in the cross section of countries, the, the employment shares vary with economic development in the 2010 cross section. And as you can see, higher GDP per hour work is associated with a lower routine employment share and it's associated with a higher abstract employment share. Uh, it's also associated with a lower manual employment share. The picture in terms of occupational income shares is very, very similar. And in terms of occupational wages, so relative occupational wages, you see that with economic development in the cross section of the 2010s, um, there is an increase in the relative wage of routine occupations compared to abstract occupations. Um, there is not much of a trend in routine to manual relative wages and not much of a trend in abstract to manual occupations either. This is the cross section in 2010. We can also look at changes over time. And one way of summarizing this is by um, looking at what happens on average in a quartile of this distribution of uh, GDP per hour um, distribution across countries. So the, the, the bottom quartile is quartile one. These are the poorest countries, the least developed countries. And quartile four is um, the, the, the richest uh, countries. 
And you can see that um, everywhere but in the bottom, the occupational employment share of routine workers fell. Um, and the abstract share increased. The manual share um, declined a little bit, sort of in the middle of the distribution or the bottom half of the distribution. Um, it didn't increase much in our data at the top either. If anything, on average, it still declines or is flat. Um, but the really interesting thing here are the wages. So here you have the relative wages of routine to manual workers again, uh, and of routine to abstract workers. And you see that this ratio of routine to manual wages increased everywhere over time. And the ratio of routine to abstract wages decreased um, everywhere but at the, in, the, in the poorest countries. And this is a different pattern now in, in terms of over time changes as I've just shown you on the previous slide here uh, in the cross section of the 2010. Here, routine to abstract wages increased. Here, they fall for most countries, okay? So to sum up these observations, um, the relative wage trends differ in the cross section versus the time series. In the cross section, higher GDP per hour work is associated with an increase in routine to abstract wages. Whereas over time, where of course GDP per hour also typically went up in most countries, um, there's a negative correlation, except in the bottom quartile. And that suggests to us that um, there's not just cross-country differences in the occupational employment structures, but also in the technologies of these occupations and how these uh, occupation specific technologies change over time. And this is what motivates really the development accounting exercise. And I don't have that much time to go into the details, but as I said, it's essentially following the methodology I have in my paper with, with Jofi. Um, and the idea is um, you specify aggregate production function, you solve for the representative firm's optimality conditions and you back out technologies from observables. And let me illustrate this first in the most simple case where you have a production function that is just specified in routine and non-routine labor. So this is a production function where yi is real GDP in PPP per hour work in country i, and it's assumed to be a CS production function in routine labor, or routine labor share here because we're working with um, GDP per hour work. Um, and i is uh, five minutes. Okay. Um, and the object of interest is the mu R, I and the mu N, I. That's the country specific routine labor augmenting technology and non routine labor augmenting technology. Um, the alpha is the invariant parameter across countries that captures the routine intensity of production. And the sigma is the elasticity of substitution between the two. Now, if you assume um, that firms maximize profits, you get some optimality conditions for them, which of course link the relative optimal labor use to relative technology and wages. But our interest is in the technology, which is here the term in red, but we can invert this optimality condition um, to have an expression for the relative technology as a function of parameters, relative wages and relative employment. Um, so this is something that will inform us about the relative technology within a country. But we are also interested in, not just in the ratio of the mu's, but in the absolute values. But we can get that because we also can take this um, relative use back into the production function and solve for the level of technology. And that is this expression. So after specifying a value for the elasticity of substitution, uh, these two e equations um, allow you to uh, back our technologies once you know the parameter alpha. Alpha we don't observe directly, but um, what we do is we impose uh, that for a benchmark country, um, the relative, all the technologies take on the same value. So we impose that for the benchmark country, which is the US, that mu r is equal to mu n. That is um, as if we treated this to be um, a TFP term for, for the USA. So alpha then captures both the routine and the 
routine intensity of production as well as the relative productivity of routine labor in that benchmark country. Um, so this is something important to bear in mind, and that's why we focus throughout afterwards on relative technologies, either across factors or across countries. Um, and here's what this looks like. Here you have a plot of the relative routine to non-routine technology in the cross section, and you can see there's a positive relationship with GDP per hour of work. So the higher aggregate labor productivity is, the higher GDP per hour of work is, the higher is the technology of routine labor compared to non-routine labor. What does it mean? We specified a value for the sigma um, of 0 0.56 following Dönig and Herondorf. So it's less than one. So the two occupational labor inputs are complements in production. So that the productivity of routine labor is higher compared to non-routine worker means technology, technical change is biased against routine workers. Is this plausible? Yes, because we see in the data that with higher GDP per hour work, there is a decrease in routine employment share. So this makes sense. And if, if you compare the, the graph for the 2010 cross section with the 1990s, you see that the line in the 2010 cross section is about three times larger. So this suggests that routine bias technical change um, increased over time. And then we want to do a richer analysis splitting uh, occupations also into um, manual and abstract. So we generalize the production function in the symmetric way, but the, the general methodology is the same. Um, and we want to account for, for, um, for, for capital uh, in a minute as well. But let me just show you, when you break up non-routine into manual and abstract, you will see that there is a benefit in doing this because um, the results imply that routine to abstract technology increases with GDP per hour work, whereas routine to manual technology doesn't have much of a trend and if anything is downwards looking. So there's a difference between manual and abstract technologies. So relative occupational technologies vary with uh, development. And um, if we want to account for, for capital, uh, we, we put in an extra layer in the CS, uh, so an extra nest. Uh, where the occupations are nested on the inside and capital on the outside. Um, and we can we, we calibrate the parameters. And that allows you also to find that the routine technologies relative to capital um, increases with economic development. So with development, technology becomes more routine biased also compared to capital. And now that we accounted for capital, we can um, also look at the level of technologies relative to the world average. Um, so here you have for the countries that we have the distribution of GDP per hour worked relative to the what I call the world average. So it's the average in our set of countries. Um, you see that the, the richest countries have 82% higher GDP per hour work than the, than the, the mean. Um, and here you have this for the, for the technologies that we inferred. And what's interesting here is you see that um, the dispersion of technologies is not the same, but manual technologies are very highly dispersed. Routine technologies are very highly dispersed, not as high as manual, but still very high. In the richest countries, uh, the technology of routine work is, is about 12 times higher than in the bottom quartile. Whereas the um, dispersion of capital augmenting technology is quite low. That's the last column. And the final thing that we do is to do a counterfactual. What would happen if all countries had the best technology that we've just computed? Um, and how would it change the dispersion of GDP per capita across countries, which we measure here by the uh, ratio of the 90th percentile to the 10th? In the data, this is 6.15. Uh, and if we gave all countries at given inputs, so at given occupational employment structures and given amounts of capital, the best technology, this would be reduced to 4.2. That's a reduction by 32%. If you look at different technologies, you see the capital augmenting technology would have the biggest impact. It's the least dispersed technology, but capital is so important that it still has a very large impact. Whereas these counterfactuals suggest that eliminating cross-country differences in occupation technology has only a modest effect. Um, and the reason for this is we treat the occupation as complements in the production and um, also differences in the employment structure itself therefore matters. 
In fact, if we were to give all countries the best abstract technology only, it would amplify world inequality. And that is because the rich countries have a larger abstract employment share, so they gain more from that. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that here we kept the occupational employment structure constant in this uh, counterfactual. But if equalizing technologies would imply convergence in the occupational employment structure, then this is likely to have a larger effect. That's something we haven't done yet, but we have to do when we're working on this at the moment. Um, so, so, so just to, to uh, conclude in one sentence, what we show here is that the occupational employment structure varies with development. And we show that through this simple development accounting framework that also occupation specific technologies uh, vary with economic development or conversely that technology differences across countries are not neutral. Um, and I think that's, that's a novel finding. Let me stop here. Thank you, Christian. Before we move to discussion, uh, there is a quick question in the chat from Johan. Christian, do you want to answer quickly now? So in your methodology, do you assume an efficient uh, allocation of production factors? Yes, we do. We do. Um, we, we assume that um, the representative firm in each country is a uh, fulfilling their first order conditions. So uh, there is no misallocation in this account. Um, yeah. OK, thank you. Thanks. Now let's move to discussion by Jim Wiskino from Nottingham. OK. OK, can you share my, can you see my screen? Not... Yes, thank you. OK, let me maximize it. OK. Thanks for having me. Very nice paper, Christian. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. Um, and I think you made a very good presentation, a very clear presentation. So what I'm going to do is like try to fix a little bit of uh, ideas, try to uh, tell people again what you do and how the methodology is, employ, uh, is carried out and what you, I think your contribution is. Then I'm going to give you like a few comments. Uh, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to some future research ideas that I think are, are come naturally after this, this paper. So what is the goal of the paper? Basically, the goal of the paper is to study routine bias technological change across countries and the implications for employment, the structure of employment, and income differences. I would be more generous and say that it doesn't only study the routine bias technological differences, but it also study, uh, studies technological differences in, at, at the occupational level. Uh, it has some nice implications for abstract bias technological change as well. Uh, Christian was very good at explaining how the paper uh, fits in the literature. But let me summarize it because I want to make a, a brief mention. Early on, we know that the literature used to focus uh, or to study differences in standards of living, the literature focused in factors versus TFP. Later on, we learned that uh, there is factor bias technical change. But when we start, first started studying factor bias technical change, we split workers into skilled and unskilled workers, where skilled workers were workers that had over a certain level of education, sorry, college complete or more or primary complete or more. The idea underlying that split uh, was that workers were imperfect substitutes because uh, going to school gave you human capital that allowed you to produce, uh, to perform different tasks in production. But nowadays what we have is employment at the, at the task level or at task, in, task, in, task, sorry, task intensity level. So we have employment at the occupational level and we know that in certain occupations, certain tasks are performed more intensively. So instead of thinking of occupation or of education as a way of splitting employment, let's think of occupations. And let's think of education as, as a way of improving uh, the way you, you perform an occupation. This is my, my preferred understanding of this new split. And I think it's more interesting. So how is the exercise carried out? Uh, well, it's kind of simple. Uh, the idea is that you start from a general CS technology. Here, I'm taking the, the same uh, two-occupation approach that, they that Christian took initially. 
have output produced by using routine and non-routine labor, alphas are the intensities, you assume a certain elasticity of substitution, and what you want to back out is these mu's that are the level of technological efficiency in routine and non-routine occupations. How, how do you back out these uh, mu's? Well, uh, you assume that factors are paid, paid their marginal, marginal product, there is no wages in this economy, no distortions. You take the first order conditions, you take the ratio of the first order conditions or the optimality conditions, and you invert them to back out the relative technologies. Then of course, to back out the levels, you use the fact that you need to also match the, the level of output per, per hour worked. This is the second step. But why do I want, I want to show you this uh, again? Because it directly uh, maps to the contribution of the paper, which is that in order to do so, you need to get data on relative wages at the occupational level and relative employment for a big set of countries, right? Of course, these alphas also uh, go into the equation, but this is uh, the, for this, to back out these alphas, you take the US as a benchmark where you take this ratio equal to one. So once you have this ratio for the US, then you have data on relative wages, relative quantities, and you're able to pin down residually technological efficiency. Of course, that also means that the specification is going to matter, that the elasticity of substitution is going to matter, and that measurement of factors is going to matter as well. So that goes directly into the contribution. I think the fact that they are able to harmonize uh, data for, 100 and for 113 countries and obtain data on employment, hours, and hourly earnings by occupation is still uh, is, uh, already a big contribution of the paper. On top of that, they match this uh, micro data with macro data with GDP per hour, capital stock, and uh, sectoral GDP at, at PPPs. And also the paper is the first paper to study and document uh, occupational employment across development, or one of the first. And the first paper to seriously document how technological efficiency varies across occupations and across countries. So let me show you some results. It's basically the same results that uh, Christian showed in his presentation. This is my preferred specification from the IPER, their paper. It's still the CES technology with three occupations. Uh, labor aggregator is in an in inner layer and is um, also uh, complementary to, to capital. So what do we observe here? We observe the differences in GDP uh, per capita between richest and poorest countries is in the order of six, while differences uh, in manual uh, technology efficiency is in the order of 40 between rich and poor countries, while differences in routine efficiency is in the order of 12, and extra and capital efficiency is in the order of two. So first takeaway, uh, big gaps in manual uh, efficiency, big ma gaps in routine efficiency. By itself, that explains why poor countries have a lot of workers uh, in manual and routine occupations, because basically they are very, very unproductive. Additionally, uh, it's interesting by itself that abstract and capital efficiency gaps are lower than in output. Initially, I was expecting a higher kick from abstract uh, technology because of uh, what we know from skill bias technological change, but under complementarity uh, of tasks, if abstract technologies are more intensive in, in, in education or workers with higher level of education or require more, high, uh, more human capital, there is still a map in between uh, routine and modern biased te uh, technological change and uh, this uh, skill bias technological change. So finally, something that I want to point out, and I think it's important, is that the gap, the efficiency gaps between uh, larger and, man and manual uh, occupations have grown between 2010s and the 90s, or between rich and poor countries. So uh, I'm going to skip the counterfactuals because I'm running out of time. But basically, the more what I, the only thing that I want to say here is that the most equalizing effect comes from uh, equalizing capital efficiency, even though capital efficiency gaps are not the biggest. 
And that these the results are similar at the sectoral level and are robust to different parametrizations, different CS specifications, and correcting for efficiency units. So let me make a couple of suggestions before I, I go into future research. Um, my first suggestion is that you guys could like do a little better uh, in, uh, with the capital split. Ideally, what we think is, is that within each occupation, each type of labor uses a specific type of machine. It's very hard to get data on specific types of machines for specific types of occupation. But what I thought is that you could split structures uh, and transport equipment and use that as like a, a type of capital that augments all, all types of labor uh, um, similarly and machinery and equipment to be more uh, complementary or substitutable with the, with the labor aggregator, namely not being factor neutral. Additionally, in, I didn't talk much about this, but when you guys do the, the measurement of efficiency, efficiency units, you measure returns to education and returns of experience for the US. And then you impute those returns uh, for all countries at all levels of development in order to get efficiency units. I think it would be nicer if you could use one representative country per quartile to measure these returns to education and returns to experience because returns to education are higher in poorer countries and returns to, to experience also and education also vary across occupations. I've done a little bit of uh, inspection of that myself. Um, additionally, something that I think would be nice is that you should discuss new implications for the world technology frontier. Uh, in Caselli's paper, his idea when he studied uh, skill bias technical change, his idea was that poor countries use technologies to augment um, unskilled workers more because they are relatively more uh, abundant in unskilled workers. Your implication is different. Poor countries have a lot of uh, unskilled workers, and at the same time, the, the efficiency at which they use unskilled workers is lower. So they are below the frontier. It's not that they are over at different points of an efficient frontier. Finally, and going back to endogenizing labor supplies, uh, I think that the current, as you mentioned, Christian, current counterfactuals are conservative. Uh, and that you, the tricky part is that you have to take into account occupation specific human capital. In the current specification, I think what's happening is that you're assuming that all human capital you're taking it to the extreme and assuming that all human capital is specific to your occupation, so there is no mobility at all. Uh, maybe once you measure the returns to education and occupation uh, uh, for occupations, at the occupational level, you can assume, for example, that all the human capital, at least all the due to experience, is lost if workers uh, are transitioning from a manual to a routine occupation or from routine to an abstract occupation. But that's just an idea. So two final things that I wanna say before I, I finish. Uh, what do I think uh, this is the next step in terms of future research? First of all, I found very interesting that gaps in routine uh, and manual efficiency have increased uh, in between 2010 and, and 1990 between poor, uh, rich and poor countries. Initially, that, uh, what I thought is that would imply that there has been a divergence between uh, rich and poor countries in terms of GDP per worker. But recently there is some papers that have found that uh, uh, there has been a revival in, a, in unconditional convergence since the 90s. So this is kind of puzzling. At the same time that there, these gaps increased, there is, uh, we observe more convergence. And finally, what I think is uh, naturally the next step is to think about what are the barriers that prevent poor countries from adopting a more efficient manual and routine technologies. Is it relative prices only, um, or is there something else more substantive going on? And that's all I have. Thanks, Nacho. Christian, would you like to respond? Yes. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for that excellent discussion. Much appreciated. Um, you, gave, you gave us lots of uh, food, food for uh, thought. Uh, let me just comment on, on, on a few points. Um, so I, I totally agree uh, with, um, it would make sense to, to um, differentiate capital further and think about what different types of uh, things do, um, 
you know, equipment is different to structures, perhaps uh, ICT capital is different to um, standard equipment and all these things. But this comes at a cost, at two costs, actually. One is you, you need to get data, which is hard for many countries. I mean, CLEMS data is, is one data source where one can go. Um, but I doubt that we would find it for 90 countries. We can be, I guess we would be happy if we had 30. That, that's one cost. But there's also a cost when it comes to um, uh, writing down the model. And that is you need to, um, to think about what that production function looks like. And once you start breaking capital up, um, you ultimately start thinking about perhaps ICT capital is more substitutable with routine labor than um, other forms of capital or with other occupations. Um, and although of course you can do that, but you impose even more structure on the model and you need to parameterize even more elasticity. So this, this is a trade-off, uh, but I agree we should try to do that uh, at least as a robustness check and see um, and see what it does. We, yeah, we should look into this. Um, I, I very much uh, like your ideas about uh, implications for the world technology frontier and to think about, you know, um, and future work thinking about what underlies uh, the lack of um, uh, adopting um, technologies, um, what, what, what are the barriers to efficiency improvement. Um, but let me talk a little bit about what you said about occupation specific human capital returns and stuff like this. So what we do at the moment is we do, as you, as you noticed, we do one min savage regression and we assign efficiency units based on parameters from that one regression to workers of all occupations in all countries. So what we're actually doing there is um, we're taking implicitly the notion that human capital is perfectly transferable across occupations, right? Um, if, you, if you are more productive by 20% in occupation R, you're also 20% more productive in occupation A or M. That's what the implicit assumption is. Um, and I think this is in a way the cleanest because if you think about occupation specific returns to human capital, we need to think about where they're stemming from. Uh, is it technology or is it just human capital or is it the interaction between the two? So I think the interpretation is a bit difficult if you have um, occupation specific returns to, to education. Um, but, but we can talk uh, more about this later. I think you know more about this than, than, than I currently do, and I'd love to, to, to uh, hear, hear more about it. So, so thanks a lot. OK, so we have one more minute. Any question or comment for Christian? Yeah, I, I just have a thing. Um, so actually, the, the fact that your technology differences are largest in um, manual occupations and then routine, et cetera, is consistent with the, uh, with the automation uh, hypothesis in the papers we see yesterday. Right? You start automating from uh, the lowest ranked occupations if it works. So these differences by occupation, I think are consistent with what you would expect from, from the automation literature. Yeah, possibly. Um, I mean, I mean, you would expect, so I struggle a little bit agreeing with what you said in terms of this manual occupation, um, because the way we try to classify it, uh, the manual, occupations are non-cognitive, but they're also non-routine, the way it was meant to be constructed. And non-routine should mean it's not that easy to automate. Um, but I, I need to think a bit more about this. Oh, thanks. I, I've just seen there's also somebody in the chat who, 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 who said they have a question. Wait, is that okay if, if we take one more question? Uh, if it's a quick one. 
Hello? Uh, Santiago, you have a question? Okay. okay. Then let's move on. Next speaker is Elisa Keller from Exeter. Elisa, would you like to share your screen, please? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, well, um, thank you, Wei, uh, Christian, and uh, Cristiano for organizing the workshop and including my paper. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, Julieta and David. And uh, the motivation for the paper stems from the observations that uh, uh, the type of tools that workers use in the execution of their jobs have been uh, uh, dramatically changing over time. Um, so the, ultimately, this, uh, we can think of this to be a byproduct of technological change. Um, so the question that we ask is, uh, what is the role of capital and body technical change for labor market dynamics? Uh, now, during the talk, just to be a little bit uh, uh, quicker, I will uh, refer to capital and body technical change as either a technical change or just a CCT for short. Sure. Um, so while well, uh, the um, outcome of the right product of a, a CCT is the availability of more efficient uh, capital growth. So one way in which we can measure um, uh, the extent of technical change uh, is by looking at the decline in the relative price of capital to consumption, say in the Holt and Greenwood tradition. So the idea being that um, as uh, more capital good or more efficient capital good became available, then the relative price uh, um, to consumption should be declining. So the stronger the technical change, the stronger uh, the decline in the price. Uh, now, these price changes have um, uh, implications for the labor market. In particular, as I was just mentioning, it might change uh, the tools that workers use in their uh, execution of their jobs, uh, and therefore the essence uh, of the occupation. And this can uh, uh, materialize with different type of effects, which comes through labor replacement in some occupation, the change in the demand across occupations, or the addition, uh, the inclusion of, uh, or uh, the um, uh, arise, if you want, of new occupations altogether. Now, a useful way to summarize all these effects is to think of uh, how workers are exposed to technical change by looking at the cross price elasticity of labor demand. Um, so the response of uh, labor demand uh, to uh, technological change, so the decline in the price of capital. Um, then to answer our main questions, what we aim to do in this paper is to uh, measure this uh, cross price elasticity. Uh, so let me just uh, start by showing what uh, this entails. And I would say a useful way to do this is to uh, revisit the early result of X, uh, which under cost and returns to scale and competitive markets, uh, we can express this cross price elasticity as a function of um, uh, five, uh, uh, four, sorry, um, key um, uh, features of the economy then uh, that we can try to parameterize. So the first one in here is the um, uh, expenditure shares. So in order to be able to measure those, what we want to have is information on uh, capital and capital prices at the occupation level, along with, of course, labor, uh, which is um, uh, more easily available. Then a second element here is the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. Um, and again, if you have information on the covariance between um, input uh, ratios and price ratios, then we will be able to parameterize it. Um, then we have uh, the demand elasticity here across occupational goods. Now, because this uh, um, elasticity involves information on the quantity and prices of occupational output, these are um, units which are intrinsically unobserved, so it's a bit harder to parameterize, and the way to go about it is just to do it within a structural model. And similarly, when it comes to the last uh, bit there, which is the labor supply elasticity, uh, which involves a selection effect via working heterogeneity. Um, so how do we go about this? So what we do is that uh, we construct a new data set um, of uh, capital stocks and prices at the occupation level. So this gives us uh, the first uh, available information of uh, CTC, so technical change at the occupation level, and also of the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor, which turns out to be uh, the, or the main important driver of the heterogeneity in exposure, so in the cross price elasticity across occupations. Uh, and then we study this, um, the effect that exposure has on employment and allocation uh, by um, uh, looking or by using a simple vintage uh, capital model, a la Greenwood, if you want, uh, which is modified to consider multiple uh, occupations, which are basically technologies, and um, an endogenous um, allocation of workers of different types across occupations. 
And uh, then we use the model to quantify the role of CCD for labor reallocation via contrafactual exercise. And so what we find is that uh, um, there is substantial heterogeneity across occupations in uh, capital per worker, CTC, and the elasticity of substitution. Let me just highlight uh, uh, the two, um, the technical change, uh, the annual technical change, which goes from a minimum of 4.7% uh, uh, for mechanics uh, and a higher uh, or a maximum of 11.4% uh, for um, uh, sales. And the elasticity of substitution, which is the smallest one in transportation, at 0 0.54, and the maximum at precision production at about two. Uh, then through the through an accounting exercise using our model, we find that uh, CCT explains uh, all of the employment gains in high skill occupations, and 91% of the gross labor reallocation between 82 and 2015. Now this is kind of uh, uh, important because uh, the way we measure CCT is not as a residual but we measure this directly in the data uh, by looking at the decline in the price of capital. And lastly, um, when we think of uh, the measure of cross price elasticity, so occupational exposure I was mentioning before, what we find is that uh, uh, this elasticity is um, informative in terms of the direction of employment and allocation, uh, but quantitatively though, it generates a much weaker effect than what we find in, um, uh, within the model. And the main difference being that uh, once you look at the parameterized cross price elasticity, you are basically taking a partial equilibrium measure. So you are not uh, taking into consideration uh, feedback effects across occupation. Okay, uh, so let me start with data construction. Uh, now, the first slides I have here is about measurement of CCD. Uh, we're going to go through it very quickly. Uh, so the idea being that um, uh, if you think of an economy saying which there is only one capital good, you can uh, uh, transform one unit of um, uh, final good, say um, this is a nominal investment, into Q efficiency unit of capital, so real investment. And then when you look at the relative price of capital to consumption, this is just the inverse of embodied technology. So you can measure um, uh, the growth rate of uh, technology or technical change uh, by looking at the decline in the price of uh, capital relative to consumption. And so we use this uh, concept of CCT and uh, uh, construct efficiency unit of uh, capital goods uh, for different types here indicated by J. So we look at the 24 NIPA categories um, uh, that you have in the US. Now, the key challenge uh, in, our, in our paper, I guess, is the allocation of capital stocks, uh, which are the aggregate across occupations. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna go through a simple example, say, of an economy that only has two occupations or two jobs, if you want. So a dental assistant and a secretary. Now say that the dental assistant uses both computers and the medical equipment, whereas the secretary only uses computer. So the allocation of medical equipment is trivial, it all goes to the dental assistant, but how do we allocate computers? Uh, now, the, ideally what you would like to know is how many hours does uh, uh, each of uh, um, dental assistant and secretary spend using computer? Now, this information is not available to us. So instead of what we do is that um, uh, we leverage information on the tools, which instead are commonly used uh, in the execution of jobs within the occupation. So for example, a tool in the category of computers could be a personal computer, a laptop computer, and all that. So in total, we have about 6,000 tools, and then uh, we come up to 6,000 tools to 24 uh, NIPA category. So this gives us an idea on the relative intensity in which a specific capital good, like computers, is used in the occupation. And uh, uh, so we basically use this um, uh, information on tools. And the way we obtain the information is that uh, for the 2010s, uh, this is relatively easy because the information is available directly in the ONET um, from the tools and technology module. For the 1980s, instead, this information is not so uh, directly available. What we can do is um, to use the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, the predecessor of the ONET and use a, a machine learning algorithm to extract the information on the tools that are uh, um, required or used in the occupation. Uh, so we do that, so we have information in the beginning and the end of the sample, then we interpolate it. And therefore we can construct a time series of the amount of tools here, Tao, which are used, uh, sorry, of a specific capital good, J, which for example is computers, which are used in each of the occupation at each point in time. And this is the base, this is a key part of uh, for our allocation um, uh, rule. So when we look at the amount of capital or efficiency unit of capital of good J, say computers in an occupation, 
This is going to be the aggregate um, available in the economy and multiply by the share of tools uh, in that particular capital category, which are used by the occupation. And then once we allocate capitals of different types, uh, we aggregate them together, we aggregate them linearly for now, and uh, compute the capital uh, stock at the occupation level. And we did then we um, compute um, or we measure the um, uh, technical change by looking at the um, uh, Fisher price index of uh, quality adjusted prices of capital relative to consumption, uh, where the shares are the average investment shares between two years. And here is what I'm plotting on the y axis, uh, normalized uh, in log term, sorry, normalized to equal one in 1982. So you see that there is a heterogeneity across occupations. So here uh, each line is a different occupation, it's a one digit occupation in um, uh, the US census. Um, so the highest, uh, the smallest, uh, sorry, um, price decline is less than 5% in here, and it happens for um, uh, mechanics, uh, machine operators, and transportation. The strongest one instead, the uh, admin services managers and uh, sales uh, is higher than 11%. Now we can have then a quick look uh, uh, at the implications if you want to the correlation with employment. So on the y axis here, I have the change in the employment share between 82 and 2015. And on the x axis, I have a measure uh, of uh, capital deepening. So I'm putting the change in capital per worker, but uh, if you put CECD directly, you will have a similar picture. So what you see just by looking at it is that there is not much of a correlation between the two measures. So for example, take, uh, I don't know, professional and admin services. They had similar extent of CTC, but they have a very different uh, change in employment. So employment increased in professional and decreased in admin services. So when we looked at this picture, what we thought is that there must be, or there might be some um, uh, additional information or uh, aspects uh, of an occupation that uh, uh, disciplines or uh, generates the mapping between uh, uh, technological change and uh, uh, the employment shares presently, or employment flows, sorry. And what we fo focused on, of course, is the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. So we went into estimating this elasticity at the occupation level. Um, so here I'm reporting the standard definition of the elasticity, so the uh, response on the um, uh, input um, uh, input ratio to the uh, technical rate of transformation, which is uh, equal to relative prices um, uh, in co under competitive markets. Now we know that in general this elasticity cannot be identified uh, um, when we when together with the bias of technology or if there is bias technical change. Um, so what we do is we estimate it in the time series. And uh, uh, we assume that the bias of technical change, uh, which we call it the labor augmenting because we go under the idea that we can measure uh, the efficiency of capital directly in the data. But if you want, you can think of it as um, a bias technology is constant over time. So it increases at uh, an exponential rate, which is constant here. So we regress the input ratios on uh, an integrating constant and time, uh, time trend, which gives us an identification of the bias of technology and then the input prices, which gives us information on the elasticity. Uh, now, of course, there is also being a time series, there is also a, simul a simultaneity, crop simultaneity uh, issue here uh, with prices and quantities. Uh, so what we do is we use an instrument. Um, so we instrument for exogenous variation in um, uh, the supply of labor, uh, so we use the 16 year lagged birth rates. We also include the uh, lack capital labor ratios as there is uh, uh, autocorrelation in the errors. And here are the estimates. Uh, I'm just gonna focus on the IV. So we see some, oh, on the aggregate, sorry, we get the uh, complementarity, so at 0 0.77. And uh, we get also complementarity or stronger complementarity for transportation, machine operators uh, and um, professionals. And on the opposite hand, so when you look at substitution, we have precision production and sales that mean services, even though uh, they are not statistically different from COVID hours. Uh, okay, so we, I was saying that this pattern uh, uh, of the elasticity might be able to uh, rationalize this little correlation between capital deepening and the reallocation of labor across occupations. And that's basically what we explore, um, or we can explore, sorry, even using um, uh, the definition of uh, or like the specification of the exposure I was mentioning before this cross price elasticity so in a partial equilibrium setting if you want. Um, so it, uh, by using or by revisiting the result of Hicks and Robinson we get this uh, close form solution of the cross price elasticity which we can uh, parameterize directly in the data. So we already parameterized um, all the um, uh, well, the two sources of cross occupation heterogeneity 
So the elasticity of substitution and um, uh, capital share. We are left with two parameters, um, the elasticity of labor supply and the demand elasticity. Now, as I was mentioning before, these two cannot be measured directly in the data. So we use a structural model to do that. But for now, I'm just going to give you the numbers. And then I'll uh, show you, if I have time, real quick, the main features of the model in a second. But I guess the most important um, uh, uh, parameter here is the demand elasticity, uh, which is higher than one, so show substitution. And I guess, uh, so this is this parameter is not my well pinned down, I guess, in the literature. Uh, the difference that we have compared to previous work is just that uh, because we measure capital at the occupation level, capital expenditures, then we can measure um, uh, occupational expenditures under the constant of the scale assumption. Uh, well, from the formula, I guess uh, we can see that uh, the sign of exposure, so whether technical change uh, increases employment or not, depends on the sign of this term here. So if the scale effect, uh, uh, which is disciplined by the demand elasticity, is higher than the substitution effect, uh, then exposure, sorry, technical change uh, increases uh, employment, otherwise it decreases employment. <clears throat> and here is how exposure looks like in the data. So on the x-axis, I am putting these one-digit occupations, which are linked uh, uh, by increasing the um, skill requirement, and I have exposure on the y-axis. So. So you can see that exposure is mostly positive. It's only negative for precision production. Uh, it goes from uh, above, slightly below 4% to uh, uh, le more than or less than minus 4% uh, percent, uh, for the precision production. You see there is a little bit of heterogeneity. And on average, you can see some uh, a, lo a loose, if you want, a U-shape uh, with um, the um, exposure at the bottom and at the top of the scale distribution being about twice the one in the middle. Um, most, let me just say that most of the heterogeneity here just comes from uh, uh, the elasticity of substitution rather than the capital share. Capital share matters a lot for transportation here. Um, yeah, so with this measure of exposure, what we can do then is to um, uh, compute the implied change in employment uh, um, that is uh, generated by CCT in a partial equilibrium framework, just by basically multiplying exposure by the extent of CCT that we see in the data. And that's what I see, I show here, sorry, in red. And uh, instead in the black, uh, uh, this is what you see in the data in terms of the employment in allocation. So I want to make two, just give you two quick comments on this. The first one is the direction. So you see that the direction uh, here of the red line or the shape of the red line is similar to the one in the data, so the black line, um, meaning uh, uh, exposed in partial equilibrium, you can have CCT generating this employment polarization that we see in the data. The second one is that uh, uh, the shape of the red line is very similar to the exposure I was showing you before telling you that most of the what's behind this employment in allocation has to do with um, uh, the elasticity of substitution. So um, employment moves toward occupation, which have a lower elasticity. And I'm stressing this because this is a substantially different mechanism than other form of um, capital deepening that were studied uh, in the literature, like uh, the routinization hypothesis, where instead uh, um, employment flows follows um, uh, capital deepening. So for example, employment uh, outflows from occupation which have the strongest uh, uh, capital deepening, which in here would be middle skill occupations. In our case, uh, the employment allocation is almost um, uh, um, independent uh, or like uh, unrelated to the extent of CCP. It's really the heterogeneity in exposure. And uh, uh, compared to instead uh, an identical exposure and um, a substitution effect, which is stronger than the scale effect, uh, which is the channel behind the uh, routinization activities. Uh, yeah, the second comment uh, that I want to make is on the magnitudes. So you see that uh, the magnitudes that are here on the left, on the axis here, are much smaller than the one that you see on the right. So the one you see in the data. Um, this has to do with the fact that uh, the measure we are using is a partial equilibrium measure. So it does not uh, consider um, the feedback effect across occupations. And the rest of uh, the talk are basically going to take care of this, um, um, this limitation, if you want, by uh, studying uh, the role of that exposure as CCT has, sorry, into a general equilibrium model of um, occupational capital and uh, uh, labor input and output. So I'm just uh, going to give you the, the biggest feature, I mean, the most important features of the model is um, uh, relatively simple. 
So we are looking at the um, uh, final output uh, here, Y, which is just the CS CES aggregator of the occupational output. And this uh, CS structure gives us the link uh, between the demand elasticity and the elasticity of substitution across um, a different occupational output. So the row uh, that I was showing in the formula before. We also have a CS structures for occupations between capital and labor. Um, this kind of standards, there are two kind of different features. The first one is that capital is occupation specific. And the second one is that um, we are assuming a full depreciation. So the uh, rental price is identical to the um, actual price. So it's the inverse of uh, CATC. We relax this show in the paper and the results are, uh, um, are um, the results I present basically go through, they're very similar. Uh, last year, labor is also occupation specific uh, and uh, it's uh, based on the comparative advantage of the worker and is allocated uh, with an endogenous uh, um, choice on the side of the workers. So I'm gonna briefly, I guess, um, explain. So we have uh, um, age demographic groups, uh, which uh, are defined by gender, age, uh, and education. Now, which worker draws um, a profiles of efficiency unit, so labor across different occupations, uh, which is a IID cliche and disciplined by the shape parameters here. So which determines um, heterogeneity across workers and the scale parameter, which instead determines the heterogeneity across uh, occupations and types. Um, then workers maximize, choose the occupation by maximizing earnings, which are the product of uh, the efficiency unit and the price, uh, uh, the occupation level of labor. And uh, um, the key prediction in here of the model is that um, uh, we get the labor supply elasticity, which is constant across occupation, and it's just the uh, shape parameter of the fresh air minus one. So this uh, structure gives us uh, the possibility of uh, measuring directly um, this parameter together with uh, estimating uh, the elasticity here. And this is pretty much what I'm describing in the slides, uh, which looks at uh, uh, bringing the model to the data. Um, just like a, as an over, well, maybe let me just uh, say that uh, um, the two parameters which are calibrated completely outside the model is the elasticity of substitution at the occupation level and here the level supply elasticity. And all the others are calibrated, some of them, I guess, estimated direct jointly. Um, and because this is a accounting exercise, uh, we our objective is to fit exactly uh, these three um, these three dimensions of the data. So the allocation of workers, uh, the average wages across demographic groups, uh, and the capital labor ratios across occupations. Okay, so then uh, I'm gonna revisit the question that I was asking before. So what is the role of CCT for labor market dynamics in the model, so in general equilibrium, but um, focusing in particular, as I did before, on the employment allocation. Um, so again, on the y-axis here is employment change. Um, on the x-axis, you have uh, the different occupations ranked by increasing um, skill requirement. The black line shows you the data and the model, uh, the baseline calibration, because remember the model fits uh, the reallocation exactly, so the change in um, uh, labor across occupations exactly. So the black line in here is the model. And uh, in order to evaluate the importance of CCT, what we do is uh, we run a contrafactual. So we take the model economy in 2016 and feed the price of uh, capital relative to consumption of the beginning of the period, so 1980. And what this red line here shows you is uh, the employment change, uh, which are generated by technical change alone. So only technical change. And what you can see is that on the when you look at the more complex, more um, uh, skilled, higher skilled occupation, you see that the model, um, so the red line here, the CCT line, follows the one in the data pretty closely. So this tells you that the CCT. Uh, has an important role into um, determining the allocation toward high skill occupations. Uh, a little bit less when you look at the middle skill and uh, much lower when you look at the lower skill occupations. Um, so the one thing uh, that I wanna say in here is just, uh, so remember this, um, uh, the results we saw before with um, uh, the cross price elasticity alone, so the partial equilibrium. In here, the magnitudes of the effects are much higher compared to before. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I guess, what happens on the lower hand of the skill distribution. Now, we can actually uh, compute that because we are doing accounting, and what we find is that uh, um, the um, demand shifter, so variations in the, um, um, of, in the shares of, uh, here, 
in the share of uh, uh, occupational output in final good production is uh, basically what's uh, the most important driver uh, of the increase in, um, uh, in, um, in employment that you see here at the lower hand of the distribution. Uh, lastly, let me just show you uh, an additional way in which we evaluate uh, uh, said the role of uh, CCT. So what we do is we look at the in-sample prediction. So we take the economy in 2015 and uh, see how well does uh, CCT in predicting employment flows uh, for the uh, next uh, 10 years, so between 2005 and 2015. So we take, um, uh, we take the average extent of CCT in the previous 10 years and then uh, compute uh, the implied uh, employment allocation between in here low skill, high skill, and middle skill um, uh, job uh, occupations. So the um, uh, predicted one is the dotted line. Instead, of what happens in the data is the solid line. And you see the model uh, of solicity is a good predictor for high skill occupation, uh, but much less when it comes to middle skill and low skill occupation. Um, so let me conclude. Um, so two main take home, I guess, from the paper. The first one is that uh, um, we are uh, providing the first measures of uh, capital embodied technical change at the occupation level. And uh, um, technic this uh, technical change is very important in um, explaining the reallocation of labor in uh, uh, high skill occupations. Now, the mechanism or the channels through which uh, CCT influences the labor market are different from the one highlighted before. In particular, they are really based on the heterogeneity in um, uh, the exposure across occupations, uh, uh, given a positive exposure. So uh, a scale effect, which is stronger uh, than the substitution effect, uh, which is, I guess, as I was saying before, different from uh, other, say, the um, uh, standard uh, or like the different, like the um, routinization hypothesis, which is an addition, an additional dimension of um, a capital deepening, which was uh, highlighted uh, in the past. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Elisa. Let's now move on to the discussion by Joe and Cario. Joe, um, are you there? Can you share your screen? Okay, thanks. Yeah, can everyone hear me? Great. Um... All right, uh, so th thank you for inviting me to uh, comment on this paper. I'll give a brief overview of the topic and, and, and what this research does. Um, and I'll give a couple of comments, suggestions, and kind of open up some, some points for discussion. Um, so what is capital and body technical change? It's progress that comes through the investment in kind of new, better vintages of capital that are more productive um, and or cheaper. And so this kind of progress uh, can drive growth. There's lots of papers written on, on how that can work. Um, so intuitively, sectors that have experienced rapid growth um, are more intensively using technologies that have seen this kind of technical change. That's the idea of those kind of models. Um, and typically, this is models as a fall in the relative price of, um, of investment over time, as in this paper, which is described in detail before. Um, however, productivity growth may fall due to kind of adjustment costs and learning um, of new, with new types of, uh, of capital, but that's, that's not considered here. So the question um, they're asking is, how, how does it affect the labor market? And so the logical conclusion is that workers are going to be differentially affected by this type of technical change. And this is gonna depend on how exposed they are to this change, the complementarity or substitutability with, with different types of capital and how workers themselves respond to technical change. That's the sorting um, part of the model. Um, and this paper is just gonna investigate this, this type of technical change across occupations and show how it impacts labor reallocation. Um, so they, they have this uh, novel data set and do some uh, nice empirics with it and then, and then uh, bring it to the model. So just a brief summary of the paper, but uh, we won't go into huge detail because you've, you've just heard all this, but basically we need kind of occupational level capital stock. Um, so they link thousands of tools to, cat to capital categories and also to occupations and the capital requirement, that's the uh, REC um, OJT here um, in a given occupation is the number of tools used in that occupation relative to all the tools used by workers um, in the economy. And then capital stock is allocated to occupations proportional uh, to this capital requirement. So now they can measure the decline in the price of capital for each occupation um, and they get this, this heterogeneity across occupations. And so the empirical results, they have these changes in tool shares, um, which is a new contribution. And so they're able to then compute this, this technical change. Uh, and um, they've got a heterogeneity between say, uh, precision production and managers 
um, they're exposed to this technical change quite differently. And then they can estimate the elasticity of substitution um, to, to help explain the, the heterogeneity um, thanks to the occupation uh, specific capital. And so the model is really clearly explained um, in the paper. Um, the, one, one key idea is that of this kind of occupation specific capital, um, which creates occupation specific goods, and that, that then um, is uh, aggregated up to a final good. Uh, production is, is uh, CES and markets are competitive and workers draw um, random variables of efficiency units of labor. Um, so then self-select into different types of occupations. Um, and technical change is, is modeled by, by these different transformation rates. Um, uh, and they find that this type of technical change accounts for uh, a large proportion of reallocation specifically into high skill um, occupations, a little bit less for others. So I have a bunch of kind of comments, queries, and suggestions. Some are just really small changes for clarity. Some may require a bit more work, but I thought I'd put them all in here um, and I hope they're, they're useful. I've separated them into kind of three parts, the, the measurement of the technical change, some of the empirical results and, and the model. So firstly, on, on technical change, so you have this quote, occupations that use a large variety of tools within a capital category will be allocating more capital. And this seems sensible. And I think you mentioned uh, in the paper that if an occupation um, heavily uses just one or two tools in terms of the time spent using those tools, that's not going to be accounted for here. Um, so this may explain some of the potentially surprising findings. Uh, for example, the share of communication tools assigned to managers didn't change between 1977 and 2016, but the share of computer tools doubled. Um, and my expectation previously would have been that managers are spending a larger share of time with communication tools um, than previously, as in a larger share of communication tools in the economy. Um, but I don't believe that time spent using tools is available in the ONET data. Um, so maybe this is something that can be uh, opened up for the Q&A if anyone has any ideas whether this is something that can be dealt with. Uh, the second is on tool shares and capital bundle shares. So to me, it wasn't entirely clear what the distinction is here. Both of these are calculated in the paper. I think the capital bundles are in the appendix and they're allocated to occupations. Uh, my understanding is that the former influences the latter. Um, however, when I looked at, um, at the, kind of what happened, so when you look at computer capital bundles as opposed to tools, um, the manager share shot up um, uh, from 8 to 32 um, percent. And for administrative services, services it also shot up um, by, by quite a large proportion too. But when looking at the changes in computer tool shares, as opposed to these capital bundle shares, managers went up a little bit less and administrative services went down quite a lot. So I just think I, I probably missed something here, but I think a little bit cl of clarity, um, just what the differences between these two things would be, would be helpful. And finally, on computer tools and communication tools. So you highlight that these are really important um, in the paper and you talk about them quite a lot. Um, but the difference between them is not, I think, entirely obvious. So looking at the appendix, computer tools included uh, computer equipment and accessories, whereas communication tools include communication devices and information technology. Um, so it's not entirely clear exactly how these differ, maybe just a list of exactly which tools um, are included in the two would be helpful, um, because they're important for the narrative of this paper. And if uh, there's some confusion as to the overlap between these two things, um, that could maybe uh, mo uh, model the story slightly. So then on, on the empirical results. So one thing you do is you uh, linearly interpolate um, the measures of occupational tools. I think just for clarity, um, it would be useful to see on the plots um, which points are interpolated uh, and which are not. Uh, I think you say that the um, ONET tool data is available from 2006. Um, so I don't know if you if you use all the data from 2006 to 2016 or if you just interpolate um, over the whole period. So I just think that would be um, helpful just, just for clarity. Um, and then uh, kind of similarly on the changes in tool shares, um, you do a 1977 to 2016 comparison. Um, which gives some really stark and interesting findings, but I think maybe just for the appendix, it would be interesting to see the trends in these tool shares over time, because it's an underlying driver of technical change. Um, it'd be interesting to see when these tool shares changed across the different capital categories. So for example, you might get a computer slowdown in the, in the computer tools, um, and it would be interesting to also see what happens to communications technology, um, which you say is, is, is important. Uh, and finally, um, you have uh, this plot showing the changes in the employment share against technical change and capital per worker. And you, you say, you know, that they're, they're, they're not hugely different. So that's this plot here uh, in the paper. Um, perhaps you'd see greater difference if you can get this at a more disaggregated occupation level. I don't know if you can. Um, but moreover, you, you mention um, this important finding in table E1 um, here that um, 
uh, workers in computer intensive occupations saw wage growth and employment decline. So that's um, in columns one and three. But for high um, uh, capital and body technical change uh, in those occupations, they saw both wages and employment growth. So this is key. This is kind of saying high technical, okay, high capital and body technical change is not just lots of computers. Uh, I don't know if there's maybe a plot you could have that would just make this point more clearly in, in the body of the text, because um, I just thought it was very, very uh, compelling um, argument for why you're looking at this type of technical change rather than just, um, say, computers. Um, and some final comments uh, about some of the stuff you did in the model. So um, one thing I liked was that you talk about the labor share decline. So you, you say that the labor share decline can be um, kind of looked at by looking at the whether you have labor or capital bias technology and whether labor and capital are substitutes or complements. And you say that the combination of these two factors is consistent with labor share decline across all your occupations. I don't know if there's some decomposition which links this technology bias and the substitutability between labor and capital with um, the labor share, but that would be neat if you, if you had it. And if not, some sort of uh, plot to highlight this story more clearly could be useful because I think you, you discuss it, but the data is, um, is in the appendix. And I, I just think this was uh, quite an interesting thing which um, maybe could be highlighted a bit more. Um, also, your te uh, capital and body technical change reallocation, uh, the finding that you've got this reallocation into high school occupations, but less so for other occupational groups, mm -hmm. that kind of fits with, with a lot of other evidence, right? So like the, the evidence on routine job loss in recessions um, from uh, Jamovich and Sioux or, or low skill employment loss from trade or, or automation. And I think you could just place that in that context quite neatly because obviously your, your, your model is only speaking to um, this particular type of technical change. Um, and uh, that's kind of maybe why it doesn't um, uh, fit the, the uh, reallocation into middle skill and low skill employment quite so well. Um, and finally, you, you have this in-sample test of, of technical change in your model. Um, so one thing you could do is you could, you, you've got this plot which shows the labor shares in the data in the model. Um, I was wondering if you could just switch off technical change in your model and just see the difference. So you've got kind of data model with technical change, model without technical change. Um, I just think that would be, uh, potentially, that would potentially tell, um, tell us, you know, how important technical change is for this uh, reallocation um, with, this in, uh, with this in sample test. And secondly, um, it's possible that part of the reason it misses this middle skill employment share decline is because of the drop in employment of routine middle skill workers that occurred during the financial crisis. And you stop, you do your in sample prediction thing up to 2005 and then more onwards. So you get this big drop in um, middle skill workers, which your model kind of misses. Um, I don't know if maybe you could change the date at which you do your in sample test um, or something like that, which might be able to um, fit that better, but um, potentially you're missing that just, uh, possibly mostly because of uh, the financial crisis and the lack of kind of bounce back in routine um, employment after that. Um, so yeah, that's all, all of my comments. Um, and uh, thank you again for letting me talk about this. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Elisa, would you like to respond to him? Yes, thank you, Joel. Uh, very nice comments, they were very useful. Uh, I have the, um, maybe let me comment on a couple. On the first one, uh, when you mentioned the um, uh, one way or, you know, one whether one option, say, in which one can uh, uh, verify or like test our assignment rule in terms of mapping this quantity of tools into a measure of uh, the usage uh, of a specific capital good. Uh, one thing uh, we are uh, uh, about the doing at the moment, but we still don't have the results, is to compare um, the usage measures that we have for computers with uh, direct measures in the sensors. Because there is this information only for computers, so we thought maybe that uh, a one way in which we can uh, have some evidence that uh, uh, what we are doing is kind of, uh, is not completely out there. So that, uh, uh, yes, that we are trying to, uh, we are uh, working on at the moment. Um, for the tool shares versus the capital bundles, um, uh, so the tool shares are computed, um, say, for the same capital goods across occupations, uh, whereas the capital bundles are computed um, uh, given the occupation, which are the capital goods that you are using. Now, is you know, one thing that we are, um, uh, we might be better though to show instead of the um, uh, capital bundles is to look at uh, the expenditures uh, on different types of capital. So probably more comparable over time. But just looking at the bundles, considering the prices have been changing so much over time. Uh, 
then uh, um, oh well on the interpolation um, uh, yes yeah, so it, the information that we get uh, is basically at some point in time 77 for the DOT and we use one of the ONET I don't remember exactly the year I think say 2010 so over time, you don't see much. So you just see really a, um, a linear uh, a movement from the first uh, from the first period to the last period. But uh, once you look at the, when it comes to the tools, but when you look at the um, uh, capital bundles instead, you see a change, especially after 2000, because uh, the price of computer has been uh, slowing down in the decline. Um, so you see a little bit of a different, not so much of a linear trend uh, when you look at the, cap at the bundles rather than the tools. Um, also on the uh, labor share decline, uh, uh, yeah, we have as two. I mean, we could uh, we could bring it into the main paper. Um, it, the, the labor share does not decline in all the occupations, so it actually declines only in a few. Uh, but um, yeah, I think we should um, uh, look uh, maybe explain better the link between uh, the bias in technology and the elasticity of substitution. Uh, lastly, uh, on um, oh yes, uh, the counterfactual with uh, uh, I was thinking about the case in which there is no technical change. So we looked at the case uh, or a version of the model in which instead uh, the technical change is identical across occupations, uh, just to make sure uh, because most of the heterogeneous so most mostly for us is really the diff for employment and allocation is really the difference across occupations rather than the levels. And what we find is similar to the partial equilibrium analysis. Um, so the most important thing for labor allocation is the elasticity of substitution. So meaning once you put um, a capital change to be identical across occupation, the results uh, don't change too much. So this much similar to what uh, I showed in the first line of the function. Thank you. Okay, I see four raised hands. Let's go with the order. The first one is Miguel. Miguel, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, it's just a question about, so so your estimates of um, capital and body technical change look very high to me. Um, so if I, so between 4.7 and 11.5, I think that's what you measure. So on aggregate, it should be around something like 7% per yes. year. What's the estimate you got for, or, or the range of estimates you got for um, labor augmenting? technology yeah it's of, it's of a similar magnitude so the bias is something like on average i guess one percent or two percent per year but uh, yes uh, so the reason why they are so high uh the measure of ccp is because once we aggregate capital goods uh, we aggregate them linearly so thinking of uh, uh there being a, um, uh, a leontief bundle of capital goods that you need to use for production we are now so an alternative way to do it is to think about the cs which is what we do basically in the extension and the maybe even better way to do it is when you sum, when we sum um, the efficiency unit is to weight by the marginal product, which is what uh, we are now working on. And once you take that into consideration, you get smaller numbers. Uh, I guess uh, now the average is seven. Uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly the number, but uh, in our new computation, the average is about 4% or something like that in the price decline. So this number are very high because of that. Right, which is- And want to have a higher- high, high. So on yeah, aggregate, it's about two percent per year. The, yes, 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 yes. Of investment. Yeah, I think in most of these, so we compare these uh, with um, uh, the computation of Cummins and Violante, mm -hmm. and most of the, the difference, or like the reason why you get a higher number, comes from uh, the nineties. So we are now basically reweighting uh, uh, the aggregator um, to just, um, uh, you know, uh, to consider either. So there are two ways. Either you take a, either we take um, uh, an assumption on the form of um, on the form of um, uh, the CS aggregator, and we estimate the system of substitution in the data. Just one way, or otherwise, we can use the uh, aggregator using the uh, uh, weighting uh, uh, the efficiency by the marginal product. Thank you. Thank you. The second one is you. <laughs> Very interesting paper. I just have a quick question. So in the tools that you observe, do you actually observe equipment, uh, sorry, um, software separately from equipment? Because we know the, the increase in the aggregate share of investment of um, the equipment share of investment is driven mostly by software, especially after um, 1990s or so. So it would be good if one can kind of isolate that and- exactly. Yeah, yeah, so. Yes, exactly. So we do uh, see software in the tools. Um, uh, price, the price of software, though, nice. price of software, though we use the price of uh, computers. Actually, the um, uh, this idea of um, 
using the tools um, uh, in the 2010 zone act uh, to uh, then measure or to allocate uh, capital across occupations uh, comes from a paper of home and he exactly looks uh, his, his objective is exactly to look at uh, uh, the difference between software and computer and how this uh, Im uh, impacted the labor market after the 2000s I just, I think this is just worth highlighting, that's all. Yeah. Okay, next one, Jospa. Go ahead. Yep, hi, Lisa. Um, so I have a question about um, like prices. So my understanding is this, my understanding is if you look at the BEA price data, they basically quality adjust some categories of capital and not others. And so for instance, your precision uh, equipment stuff, those guys maybe are using like great robots, which embody a lot of software, but we don't quality adjust uh, for quality improvements in that type of capital. So do you have some way of accounting for that or? Um, yeah, so we use uh, the um, methodology in a Cummins and Violanta, uh, which is basically um, uh, extrapolating the data from Gordon. So the quality adjustment you see in the Gordon series, which is a little bit earlier on, uh, I think if I remember well, it ends in the 80s. And then using extrapolation to correct for quality in the in the, in the period after that, basically. But how do you measure quality of goods that we don't know the quality of, like robots? Yeah, or so, this is a, um, so this is the um, um, so this is a, the work of Gordon, and um, the way to do it is to I mean the way I mean one way to do it is to run a, um, a regression in which you price so you bring information on different uh, so take for example tractors. If you have mm -hmm. information on different characteristics, uh, you price uh, each of the characteristics, and then uh, you you are mm -hmm. able to measure. You may, you may, you're able to to fix the quality, meaning the features of the tractor, and then add up the price corrected by quality. Right, but since I guess the BA don't do that, are you doing then no, that for no. all of the categories? No. So the way um, so uh, Gordon does that of giving information on this for uh, different uh, categories of uh, capital goods. So mm -hmm. uh, the idea is to extrapolate this quality adjustment to the period afterwards. I see. So for instance, the quality adjustment of computers, you just impute that to all other categories or something like that. So in which? No, 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 no. For the same, uh, so for the same category, then uh, you look at the price correction of the, uh, mm -hmm. um, compared to the BA in the period in which you have information on the um, price corrected by quality, and then you extrapolate that relationship in the future for computers. And then you do the same for um, tractors and then for uh, you know, out, cars, et cetera, et cetera. So for each of the category. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. When you are muted. You're, you're muted. Oh, sorry. So, uh, last question from Ada. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the paper, Elisa. Uh, I th I have just a related question to uh, you. Uh, how far uh, your uh, set of uh, capitals go? Do you include intangible capital? Uh, I mean, not just software, but others like training. I mean, uh, this uh, classification that uh, exists uh, for the claims, at least. This is one uh, point. And the second is, uh, how different is the idea of the capital embodied technological change compared with what we saw yesterday and the work of Carabar Bonis and Newman? That basically what they use as a proxy is the relative price of investment goods to uh, consumption goods. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. On your first question, uh, basically we have the 24 NIPA categories. Uh, so it's the 23 plus software. Uh, in the US. Uh, I believe this is comparable. It's a little bit maybe more disaggregated than what you see in CLEMS, uh, but you can uh, you could map uh, one into the other. And uh, uh, for the measurement of CCT, yes, basically we use exactly the same measurement, right? So we are looking at, uh, we measure uh, capital and body technical change. So we call it capital and body technical change just because we are looking at the decline in the price at the occupation level. Whereas usually investment specific technical change relates uh, uh, to a capital good. But the measurement of uh, the, the idea of the measurement of technical change at the at the capital good level is like that identical to uh, carabobins and so yeah so it's the same it's the same idea basically. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, Cristiano, uh, would you like to announce now something? Yes, yes. so uh, hi everyone, I just wanted to say that uh, we, um, as you might know, at the bank, we have um, a blog that is called Bank Underground, and we would like to uh, host a couple of um, um, guest posts uh, from any of you if you're interested in um, advertising your paper. So uh, the idea, I'll send an email around, but the idea would be if any of you in, is interested in writing a post about your um, paper, is like, uh, you know, the Vox U uh, type of posts, um, please, please let us know. Uh, and um, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, one word of caution uh, is that your paper needs to be public in some way or another. So there needs to be a link to a, to a working paper. If you want any more info, just uh, contact me, but I'll send an email around to everyone later today or, or Monday, okay? Thanks. Okay, sorry for the overrunning. Uh, we have for a, a short break now until a quarter past. Okay, see you later. Okay, so uh, this is the last talk by Lucas Rahel from LIC and the Bank of England. Okay. The floor is yours. Go ahead. Great. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Thank you, uh, Wei, Cristiano, and uh, Christian for putting this great conference together. Very happy to be part of it. Um, uh, this is uh, a, quite a preliminary uh, work on automation, unemployment, and inequality. And part of the motivation for this, uh, uh, for this project comes from looking at public discourse and public's attitude uh, towards technologies and specifically towards automation technologies. This figure that I'm showing you here comes from a US Pew survey done in 2017 and it shows that um, about 80% of people think that the possibility that the machines could do many of the jobs currently done by humans is uh, very or somewhat realistic um, and about 75% of people are uh, actually quite worried about this prospect, so very or somewhat worried. When you look at the details of the survey, but also more broadly at the, uh, at the public, discussion, public, public discussions in the media about uh, these automation technologies, the, these worries reflect concerns about uh, unemployment, but also concerns about widening gaps between the rich, uh, the rich and the poor. And I think this raises interesting questions. So, First, does automation lead to high unemployment or under what conditions that, does it do so? So are these, are these um, concerns warranted? Second, like how does the associated risk uh, at the individual level affect the individual behavior and equilibrium outcomes? So in other words, does the fact that people worry about this in and of itself matter? And third, interpreting this um, rich uh, versus poor kind of quite literally, uh, conditional on skill are differences in individual wealth uh, important for how different people wear their technological shocks. And the current literature cannot really answer these questions directly because all these macro papers about uh, automation technologies, they feature no equilibrium unemployment. Um, they focus on the case of complete markets, so perfect insurance at the individual level, and they focus on heterogeneity in skills, which is ob obviously extremely important but they sort of sidestep the heterogeneity in wealth. And so what I do in this paper is I study the impact of automation shifts in a gender equilibrium model that has these uh, components that will allow me to shed some light on these questions. So I, I, I use a framework where uh, there is equilibrium unemployment, uh, there's uh, uninsurable risk at the individual level, and uh, endogenous technology choice, where, whereby the firms decide whether to automate the production lines or not. Uh, in all of these elements, I'm going to stick to, uh, a sim for, for the talk today anyway, I'm going to stick to a simple textbook formulation. So uh, you, you'll, be, you'll be able to re recognize a, lo a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these elements as I go along. Um, but this also means that today I want to only draw out qualitative implications. I'm not yet at the stage of really um, giving you any quantitative uh, predictions. And I'm gonna highlight where, where I need to kind of do more work, but also would very much welcome your, your thoughts. So in terms of what I find, uh, first on the unemployment dynamics, um, 
Automation shock induces this immediate shakeout as some firms uh, you know, fire their workers and switch to automation technologies. Uh, but really beyond that very immediate shakeout, unemployment first declines. And that is driven by uh, weak wages that are initially, uh, initially there in, the, in equilibrium. And these weak wages drive a strong job creation. And I'm going to show you that this is particularly the case in sort of low pay jobs. Then beyond that, uh, in the sort of longer term, unemployment, is ri unemployment rises somewhat as with time workers accumulate uh, assets, accumulate capital, and that strengthens their bargaining position. And uh, bargaining position or bargaining power um, is going to be important in this framework, uh, specifically you know, on this ability to weather technology shocks, uh, uh, individual wealth is going to matter. And it's going to matter because exactly it's going to determine uh, a worker's, uh, worker's power in this situation. Specifically in this kind of framework that I'm, um, that I'm using here, there's going to be a wage schedule in individual assets. So individual um, workers' wages is, are going to be increasing in individual assets. Uh, that has been shown uh, theoretically in, in some previous papers in the literature. What, what I'm uh, focusing on here is that technology shocks are going to be increasing the slope of this relationship. So they're going to be making this wage schedule steeper um, precisely because of this power dynamic. Um, and uh, so one interpretation of this is that wealth inequality effectively begets income inequality in this framework. Finally, there's some interesting general equilibrium mechanism at play, and specifically, they can, the mechan these mechanisms can amplify the, um, the, the, the consequences of the initial shock. So specifically, both the weaker labor market and the steeper wage schedule in this uh, in equilibrium is going to lead to higher saving in equilibrium, and that's going to push down on the cost of capital, potentially uh, allowing further, uh, you know, further establishments, further firms to to automate, and so th that's the, that's going to be the amplification. Okay, so let me give you a uh, kind of impressionistic uh, view of, of the of the model uh, before I show you the results. So, on the household side, households really solve uh, a, a basic consumption saving problem in incomplete markets when they they face some idiosyncratic risks. So they maximize. Uh, expected value of their utility subject to a budget constraint um, where their income depends on which state they are in. And they can be simply employed or unemployed in my model. When households are employed, they earn a wage that can be a function of assets, and we're going to come on to this uh, in a minute. If they're unemployed, they uh, earn some income hedge. Think about it as home production. And here at the bottom, we have the, the borrowing constraint, meaning that some of the idiosyncratic uh, uncertainty is, is not insured. Importantly for my framework, these transition rates between the different states are going to be endogenously determined in the labor market. So the transition from employment to unemployment is going to happen with intensity sigma, that is the job separation rate. And that uh, intensity will uh, in particular depend on what's happening to automation. If there's a lot of automation happening right, right now, then uh, a lot of workers are separating, right? Um, uh, conversely, the, the, the flow from unemployment to employment uh, is going to happen with intensity F, and that's the job finding rate. That's going to depend on the degree of tightness in the labor market effectively. Note here that individuals are assumed to be identical ex ante, and specifically, I'm assuming no skill differences. Not because skill differences aren't important, but in order to uh, really underscore what I'm bringing to the table with this new framework, I'm going to do everything conditional on scale. But I think going forward, I definitely would like to um, uh, complement this framework with the skill heterogeneity. And I think there will be some interesting interactions. But for today, all households are um, ex ante identical. On the technology side, I'm assuming uh, a, a task-based microstructure of production. Uh, and this is probably the simplest, uh, the simplest way to write this task-based model. So aggregate output is just a Cobb Douglas aggregate of, of different tasks. And there's a, ta there's a task spectrum that goes from zero to one. Um, just an aside here that, you know, th this means that the, the model is effectively like a detrended economy. So you can think about um, uh, both automation and creation of new tasks along the balanced growth path that's, that are happening. Here I'm focusing on, on a detrended version of that and I'm going to analyze only a temporary kind of one-off shocks to, to automation. 
Anyway, uh, all, all the tasks can be produced by workers, but some tasks between zero and mu can also be produced by capital. And so these are the technologically automated tasks. Gamma J is going to be an important object here is the capital task requirement in task J. And uh, in this, uh, I, I, I follow the usual convention here that I order this task in such a way that this gamma is increasing in J. And so in equilibrium, it's going to be the, uh, the tasks on the uh, sort of closer to the zero end. So on the left side of the task spectrum, they are going to be automated. In terms of markets, when firms decide to uh, use the uh, capital intensive technology, the, the, the uh, automation technology, they go into the capital market that's basically perfect. So these firms can rent capital at rate uh, at some rate R and uh, capital depreciates at some rate delta. More interestingly, when they go to the labor, when they decide to use the manual um, technology, they go to the labor market that's characterized by search frictions. Uh, and this is standard textbook uh, Pisaridis model. Uh, so firms will need to post vacancies. There's going to be free entry to vacancy posting. Workers will uh, engage in random search. And once the firm finds a worker, they will bargain over wages. So, so that's, uh, that's effectively the, the, the model in a nutshell. Uh, let me now uh, focus on a steady state equilibrium. And I'm going to start with uh, a kind of a short definition or short version of the definition of the equilibrium. So you can think about the equilibrium as a set of the interest rate that equilibrates the asset market, the wage schedule, that is the result of the bargaining between uh, workers and firms, uh, theta, uh, which, is the, um, uh, which is the labor market tightness, um, and M or M star, which is the degree, equilibrium degree of automation in this economy. And in equilibrium, households will maximize utility and firms maximize profits. As I mentioned, there's free entry to vacancy creation and the asset market equilibrium requires that households asset holdings are equal to the capital of all the firms that use uh, machines, but also the value of uh, uh, manual firms, because these firms will make profits and so they will have some uh, basically equity value. So let's now think about what are the key properties of the steady state uh, equilibrium. And the first thing I want to think about is how is the degree of automation um, determined in, in equilibrium. And it turns out that the equilibrium has got this block recursive structure where this M is dependent, depends only on the real interest rate and doesn't depend on any of these labor, labor market variables. Um, and so uh, this is basically stated up, up here on this slide. So basically I can plot this relationship, uh, which I can characterize in a sort of closed form solution um, uh, between interest rate that's endogenous in the economy and uh, the equilibrium automation. So this is what, what, what this looks like. This uh, dashed yellow line is, uh, is that curve. That's the unconstrained demand for automation. Uh, for any interest rate uh, you give me, I can tell you what uh, is going to be the degree of automation in equilibrium. Of course, technology might be constraining this, uh, this unconstrained schedule. So beyond mu, no tasks can be further automated. Uh, and so uh, uh, this, this curve becomes the, the actual demand for automation is just, uh, uh, just the, 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 the red line here, which becomes vertical at mu, right? But for the talk today, I'm going to uh, focus on an equilibrium that's not technologically constrained. So I'm going to think about uh, an equilibrium where the technology of automation is determined by market prices and specifically by uh, by the interest rate. So an example equilibrium like that is, is, is shown here in this uh, in this combination between R star and M star here. But in the paper, I also consider uh, the equilibria that are concentrated here, where, where the technology uh, constraints uh, the 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 uh, spectrum of tasks that are uh, automated. Okay, so now all these tasks beyond uh, M star, so all these tasks are going to be performed by workers in equilibrium. Uh, and as I mentioned, workers' wages will uh, be an outcome of this uh, wage bargaining process. And what does uh, what does this outcome look like? We know from the paper of uh, Crossell and co-authors that in this uh, setting with uh, idiosyncratic risk, the equilibrium wage schedule is an upward sloping curve. So on the x-axis, you have workers' assets and on the y, you have the wage. Effectively, 
what this curve says is that workers that are close to the borrowing constraint that are, that are uh, asset poor, they work at a discount. And that's um, the interpretation is, is, is straightforward. For these, work these workers are really desperate to find a job. So for them, the surplus from being employed is really high because they basically behave in a hand to mouth fashion almost. Um, uh, so uh, the firm is able to extract some of that extra surplus uh, fr from these workers. Whereas for, for asset rich workers, they are uh, much more picky, uh, if you like, and uh, uh, can negotiate much, much harder with, with their employer. And so this is this uh, power dynamic between the, uh, the firm and the worker depending on the individual assets. The, the workers uh, or the, the, the consumers uh, solve the consumption saving problem by observing this uh, or realizing this uh, uh, relationship between wages and assets and also seeing the uncertainty that is, uh, that is hitting them from the labor market side. And so the saving decisions can be summarized by these two uh, Euler equations uh, for employed and for, uh, for the unemployed. You can see that savings, in other words, the consumption growth rates are going to be higher when the a wage schedule is steeper and also when the labor market is weaker. And, uh, I think the interpretations are, are straightforward. Weaker labor market just means higher and um, there's more risk and so there's going to be more precautionary saving. Um, a steeper wage schedule uh, means that uh, it's uh, the return to being kind of asset rich are, 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 are higher, right? So, uh, so that boosts saving. And these saving decisions, once you, uh, you know, numerically uh, aggregate them together, they give an asset supply schedule that is upward sloping in the assets interest rate uh, space. Uh, so this is the kind of Iagari diagram for those of you who are familiar with these incomplete uh, market models. Um, the asset supply curve is upward sloping because for a very large level of assets around here, our households are almost perfectly insured. And so they require the interest rates that is high, uh, close to their um, uh, subjective discount rate. Whereas when, asset, when assets are really low, there's a lot of uh, risks that are hitting the households and they're willing to hold these assets even for low interest rate. The asset demand in this economy is chiefly composed of the demand for capital by the firms that are uh, using the automated technology, but also there's this uh, value of uh, equity uh, of the manual uh, producers. Okay, so the steady state equilibrium is at point A, at some level of uh, aggregate assets and some level of the interest rate. So let me now think about how automation, how an automation shock affects um, this steady state equilibrium. And I'm going to think about a, a, a shock where capital becomes more productive. Speci specifically, I'm going to uh, think about this capital task re requirement, this gamma J, shifting from the blue curve here to the, to, to the green. So effectively the capital uh, yeah, capital becomes uh, cheaper to use, becomes uh, becomes better. What are the what are the first order kind of effects in terms of equilibrium uh, costs and task prices? Well, naturally, this uh, more effective, more efficient capital leads to a decline in the cost of production with uh, automated technology. So this is the downward shift in this um, uh, solid curve here. And so what happens is that these tasks that were already produced with capital can now be produced uh, more cheaply. There's also some, some tasks that were previously produced with labor. So these are, these are these tasks here that can now be produced with capital because uh, that's the most uh, efficient form of production. Now, because of all these productivity gains or in other words, the declines in the price of, um, uh, price of automated tasks, the relative price of manual tasks increases. So you can think about the aggregate price level being normalized to one. The average of these uh, circled lines need to be uh, roughly one. So the fact that the prices here decline lead to an increase in the price of manual goods. So what I'm going to denote this P, P bar is this uh, uh, exactly this price of manual tasks. And so from a perspective of a, of, of a, of a match, of a firm, firm worker match, this is an extra surplus, right? That, uh, that the workers and the employers will share through, through the bargaining process. And so now I want to explore what the, how this bargaining process works and what, uh, what, what the result is. So you can think about this bargaining process as, um, uh, as, as restoring the balance between firms and workers surplus from a match. So if, if the wages didn't change at all as a result uh, of the shock, 
all of the extra surplus will be appropriated by, by a firm because a firm is able to sell uh, its product at a higher price. Uh, so how is this extra surplus shared between uh, workers and firms? Uh, I'm going to walk you through these three, these three diagrams in, uh, in turn. So the first, the first panel shows this relative surplus between the value of the job, so that's the surplus for the firm, and the difference between the value of being employed and of being unemployed. So that's the surplus of the worker. And just think about, just look at the green panel for now. So this effectively shows that this higher price of manual uh, tasks it boosts, um, without any further changes, it boosts the um, surplus of, of, of a firm, um, yeah, boosts the job value. So wages are going to adjust to, to redistribute some of this, uh, some of this uh, rise in the surplus to the workers. But the key thing is that here, the sensitivity of the surplus to the wage is much higher for the workers that are asset poor. And the intuition here is that for the workers who are you know, who don't have much assets, any change in the wage is going to be uh, directly affecting how much these workers consume, right? Because they're very much reliant on their labor income. They don't have much, uh, much saving to, to, to smooth their consumption. Of course, for the workers who are sort of all, all the way here, who are asset rich, they, they again rely on the current wages much less. And so the, the wage needs to move much uh, less, a smaller amount, in order to equilibrate this, uh, these differences in surpluses. And you can see that here in the final panel, which shows the, which decomposes the changes in wages in equilibrium. You can see that the green bar is no longer a rectangle, um, like in the first panel, but instead the wages need to increase by relatively less for these asset uh, poor workers relative to the asset rich. But there's also other effects, like the weaker labor market is particularly bad news for these guys who are close to the borrowing constraint. Uh, and then there's the general equilibrium feedback effects, which are, uh, which are again, driving these, these poor guys to increase their saving by more uh, than, than, uh, than the asset rich. So overall, you see this uh, a steepening of the wage schedule. So the percentage change between the initial and the new steady state of wages is actually such that uh, the asset poor workers uh, get a pay cut as a result of this situation, uh, of this shock. <clears throat> and the asset rich uh, workers get, any, get a pay increase. Okay? So that's the steepening of the wage schedule. Now, let's think about what that means for, for labor demand uh, or for, uh, for incentives for vacancy creation. These incentives will be pinned down by the free entry condition where the firms effectively uh, create vacancies until the expected cost of creating a vacancy, which is here on the left-hand side, is equal to the expected uh, gain from doing so, which is just the, basically the job value that they create um, uh, uh, integrated over the assets of those people who are uh, seeking for jobs. So there's going to be two opposing effects on job creation. This JA, uh, so the value of a job, is going to increase uh, uh, as a result of this shock because of this rise in the price of uh, uh, the selling price of these goods. It's going to increase by most for asset poor workers uh, because these guys actually take a pay cut. It's not going to increase much for asset rich workers because they all extract almost all of the surplus from the firm. But the second thing that's going to be happening is that the capital deepening of this economy is associated with workers holding more and more of, uh, uh, of assets and capital over time. And so, as you can see in the right, the distribution uh, of the unemployed in terms of the uh, uh, asset holdings shifts to the right. And so the two opposing effects are on the one hand shifting up of this uh, job value function. On the other, we're sliding down this profile um, towards, the, towards the territory where this job value is lower. Okay. This, this, sorry, ooh, sorry. These two effects will play out differently over time. So the wage effect is going to come quickly while the accumulation effect is going to take time. And you, you're able to see that in this, uh, in this diagrams on the left. So this shows the transition of the uh, distribution uh, over time from the blue to the red. You can see that uh, as usual in these accumulation models, you know, capital deepening takes, uh, takes some time. Well, the changes in wages is, is instantaneous. So the blue line is straight away 
um, uh, you know, lower uh, for for much of the uh, much of the asset spectrum. And this effectively drives the dynamics of unemployment. So let me just uh, walk you through that. So when the shock hits, there's some initial shakeout, and some people lose their jobs. That's the spike in unemployment. But in a relatively short time, less than a year, unemployment actually falls below its initial level because from the firm's perspective, uh, they're able to hire workers really cheaply. Um, uh, and so that boosts job creation. Over time, as workers rebuild the, the, build their capital holdings, and they, their bargaining power increases, unemployment rate increases again. And so these two offsetting effects between lower wages and, uh, initial, well, lo lower wages initially and then uh, accumulation of capital leads to unemployment, uh, uh, the effect of unemployment being ambiguous. I mean, in this particular case, unemployment increases, but this is, uh, this is dependent on the calibration. And I'm still obviously working on that uh, quantitative aspect. So my final slide is, uh, is, is going back to this Ayagari diagram. Uh, and here I want to show you this amplification due to higher saving propensity. So, so we were at the point A in the initial steady state. Um, the capital uh, uh, technology shock uh, leads to an outward shift in the demand for capital. So the, the, the black line shifts to the dashed here. So the usual uh, model would have our equilibrium here, but the general equilibrium feedbacks in this framework with uh, idiosyncratic risk mean that people actually save more for any given interest rate. They save more because of the weaker labor market, but also because of this uh, steeper wage schedule. And so the asset supply curve shifts to the right. So what you can see is this extra degree of automation that happens in equilibrium. Um, uh, and that, that is effectively this G amplification of the uh, original shock. Okay, so let me uh, conclude. So I, in this paper, I study technological shifts in an economy with unemployment and idiosyncratic risk. This is uh, still very preliminary, uh, but I think the model will hopefully in the future, we will be able to uh, answer some of these interesting questions that I posed at the start. My answers at the moment are, are you know, does automation lead to high unemployment? Well, uh, the effect is ambiguous, but uh, weak wages dominate in the short run and this uh, following increase in the long run to the extent that workers manage to accumulate capital. Um, individual risk matters at the, at the aggregate level because of these amplification effects via uh, capital supply. Uh, and conditional on skills, uh, differences in individual wealth can be, can be important. So wealth inequality can beget income inequality to the extent that wealth determines the worker's power in this, uh, in this firm worker relation. Uh, let me stop here, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lucas. Uh, the discussant is uh, uh, Johan Gunnar from Kent. Johan, would you like to share your Discussion, slides? Uh, if I can, why not? Uh, <clears throat> um, all right. So, so, first of all, Lucas, thank, thank, thanks so much for this clearly written clearly presented paper that actually links to existing literature and then highlights the differences. I, I did enjoy it quite a lot. So what this paper does is it analyzes the, the impact of automation on unemployment and inequality in a quite rich environment that has task-based production, uninsurable individual risk and some labor market frictions, all, you know, within, all within a general equilibrium framework. And this is a very well executed paper. It's a well written paper on an economically and socially important topic. I mean, I don't think there's any need to justify the social importance, but like if you do an online search about cartoons about and robots, and then you will see numerous examples of highlighting the fact that this is an issue that people do care about. Right. So just Putting in the perspective was for them to compare with the general and super papers where they look at the productivity effects of automation, displacement effects of automation, and reinstatement effects of automation. So this paper focuses on the first two elements, like the productivity effect and the displacement effect. 
but this comes at the benefit of doing a more deeper analysis on unemployment and inequality, right? So that's the benefit. So if I borrow some figures from, from, from these papers, so what we have is that we have different tasks. Tasks are ordered from easier to automate to harder to automate. And that means the cost of automation is going up. And interest rate is part of that cost of automation. And there's like a free frictionless market in the capital, the free, free frictionless capital market. That means that the, the price of those tasks are push down the cost of producing those tasks, right? And then there's like a, some manual goods, that like there are some tasks that are produced manually with, with labor. And then that in equilibrium, they have like a constant price. So if cost of automation is lower than the manual production, those tasks are automated. If they are higher, if the cost of automation is higher, then those tasks are manually produced. Okay, so this is quite a practical framework. I guess like I have one question here is, is a frictionless market for capital the right framework for analyzing automation, right? So either you, so like to hire labor, you require some costly investment, like you need to cause some vacancy, there might be frictions or so on and so forth. But like in this, to find the right capital to automate might also be at least as frictiony, if there's such a word, right? So I guess like my question is, is this a critical assumption in your results? You can say that this is not a very critical assumption and everything should follow. That's also fine. So that, that one exercise that this paper does is like, suppose that there's like a uniform increase in technology or a uniform decrease in the cost of automation. So that means that's a kind of like a capital augmented technological change. And in overall the cost of producing tasks manual tasks go up and then equilibrium price of the, or, or the cost of the prices of the cap automated tasks go down, the price of the manual tasks go up. So that is maybe the initial effect. But there are like quite interesting thing going on this manual section, this pink manual section, where there's like there's some vacancy posting, there's a wage schedule, the saving behavior, so there's like a rich dynamics going on here as well. And then, so there are like higher capital demand shifts up the interest rate and higher savings also shifts up the supply. And overall, we can say that this, the interest rate goes up compared to the initial interest rate. So that means it will push up uh, the, the cost of automation a little bit. So if you compare the initial long run equilibrium of the black with the later long run equilibrium of the, of the purple, right? So all those things going on. So that is kind of a restructure. And on the background is the wage schedule first, the wages as an wage is an increasing function of wealth. And automation leads to steepening of this wage schedule. So where's this direct effect comes from uh, the poor having low marginal utility of consumption. That means the, the, the firm needs to pass smaller share of price increase to, to, the, to the poor. So that's the direct effect. And then there's some macro effects coming from the lower job finding rates. That means if the job finding rate is, is low as an insurance people, like especially low poor people would accept jobs more easily. 
and interest rate goes up from the initial steady state to the new, to the new steady state. And higher interest rate lowers the value of having a job more for the rich. So both, all of these things leads to the steepening of the wage schedule. So my suggestion would be like, if you can do some kind, you do it to some extent, maybe like, if you do a, like a decomposition of the changes in, in inequality or like in the earnings inequality into direct and macro effects, that would be helpful. That's one suggestion that I have. Of the find measure of inequality and then decomposing that changes in inequality into direct effect coming from the effect from the, and then the macro effects might be helpful. And the other thing that you already stress is this is all this is like a within group inequality, right? Like it, this is the inequality among people that have this similar skills. And typically people when, when people think about inequality, they consider about inequality among different educated people, inequality between workers and capitalists, and so forth. So this doesn't mean that within group inequality is not important. I guess my I would like to see some like the verbal arguments or some justifications on why the readers should care about this within group inequality as well. Right? And maybe like a question is like how. Maybe you can make some arguments of how your this particular research complements your research with mole and restrict, or like how maybe they look at the different aspects of inequality and then how they each complement, how those two papers complement each other. But like overall, like again, okay, an interesting result. Again, I think it's good to know. It's like you say, you argue that automation can increase earnings inequality even among similarly skilled employed workers. And I find that quite interesting, like not just inequality across different, different age group people, but inequality among similar educated people might also go up. So that is, that is also interesting. And the other thing that you do is like, so this cost of innovation goes down. That has an impact on the wealth distribution and wealth distribution has an impact on earnings inequality. So in macro, we have this chain events quite often, right? The A has an impact on B, B has an impact on C. I think it's always good to go back to data to see whether the variations in B, variations in the middle step that we generate from our model is of reasonable magnitude if you compare to the variations in the actual data, right? So that's kind of a disciplining exercise. I mean, so in your, this numerical example, it seems like the median wealth kind of doubles, right? I don't, I don't, I cannot see it exactly, but like a, there's a substantial, increase in the median wealth among the similar skilled workers or similar skilled employed workers. But if I look at this uh, wealth by education graph from taking from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, it seems like Yes, this median wealth, even among the similar educated people change, but the change doesn't seem that much, right? So maybe you can, you can make some arguments if this change is reasonable or there might be some parameters within your model that, that you could adjust in your, in your calibration that would give more reasonable changes in the wealth distribution. And one thing that I liked, so 
is that you, you do various decompositions and then those decompositions really helps the reader to understand the mechanics of the model, what's going on in the model. So that's, that's, that's great. And I think you could follow on that and do some decomposition on the variables of interest, right? Unemployment rate, inequality, and how, un and then decompose the changes in unemployment or inequality at the end into different forces. That might be one suggestion. But overall, this is a great paper. I enjoyed it quite a lot. It's well done, well executed, and well presented. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Lucas, do you want to respond? Yeah, uh, thanks so much for such a, a nice discussion and being so kind to, to, the, to the paper and great suggestions. Let me just pick out a couple uh, of points. Um, so on the question whether it matters that the, the, the capital market is, is, in, is frictionless, I, I, I don't see this as a central assumption because to the extent that you think that there's some imperfections there uh, that uh, are costly for firms to find the right capital, you can kind of subsume that within the capital efficiency. Uh, and so uh, that kind of is without lots of generality, but of course, uh, there could be some richer frictions that 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 would matter that maybe in future work would be would be useful to to analyze. Um, in terms of your question about how it complements the other paper uh, on automation and inequality, I think I think it quite nicely complements it. That other paper looked specifically at the top, or particularly at the very top of the of the income and wealth distribution. I think this paper very much focuses on the bottom and what happens to uh, to the people who are, because of this wage schedule dynamics, who are kind of most desperate in the most desperate situation where, where when these technology shocks hit. So I think that's, in my mind, that's kind of how they complement each other. Um, your your point about the wealth distribution is uh, very well taken. So obviously this textbook, uh, Ayagari model, fails miserably at generating realistic wealth distribution. Um, uh, we know that we have to fix that though. So I think, you know, in the future work, I want to, uh, I want to fix that. So I have a, a fat tailed uh, distribution, which looks more like a Pareto rather than the bell shaped distribution. And uh, the size of the shock, you're absolutely right that it's uh, on the, definitely on the big side in terms of the aggregate capital deepening. Um, uh, the reason for that is I have only one asset in this economy and the interest rate is quite low. So in order to match the increase in the labor share, I need to have quite a large increase in the, uh, in the in the capital to output ratio, basically, but uh, but again, that's something that I would I want to do in the future, enriching the model and uh, uh, thinking more carefully about the calibration. I think that's uh, that's going to be very important. Um, yeah, let me stop here. Thank you very much again. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, excellent. Uh, Christian, I will hand over to you now. Well, just to say uh, thank you to everyone for making this uh, a great workshop, I think. Um, I think we've seen many nice papers. We explored technological change and the consequences on the macroeconomy from many different angles. And um, yeah. I think it was great. So thank you all for your contributions. Thanks for organizing. Yeah, thanks, Christian. Thank you for, to, to the organizers for thank yeah. Christian and Wei that did most of the most of the of the work. And let's hope that we can uh, all meet uh, at some point <laughs> in the near future in person. Um, enjoy the weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Very nice program. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.